speed deck. That's from the era before Master Rule 1. Now the side deck here, the change is that you now can include any number between 0 and 15. Prior to this, and I'm not really sure why it matters too much, but prior to this, you could only have exactly 15 or exactly 0, no number in between. Now, realistically, you want to have 15 spots in your side deck. There's basically no reason not to include 15 cards. Even if you're someone that has a very, very small collection, you might as well throw in any random card that might be useful against some random deck. What's worth noting here is that none of these deck sizes have actually changed over the past 12 years, which is really, really impressive. Now what about the new mechanics, synchros and tuners and all that stuff? Well, I feel like when synchros were first introduced, you know, it was a big change for the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. Keep in mind that between the first series and the second series of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, from the original series to Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, you don't have something like synchros. I mean, certainly we had new mechanics, I think of like Gemini's for example, but you don't have a new extra deck mechanic, you still just had fusions. So when synchros were introduced, you know, a lot of people were really worried, you know, is this going to be the death of Yu-Gi-Oh? Nowadays, I don't see as many comments from people saying synchros ruin the game. I mean, I certainly see them occasionally, which is really funny because now the game has had synchros longer than it didn't have synchros because they've been around for 12 years. But at the time, you know, new things are scary. Change is scary. And that's really what a lot of people were feeling when they saw synchros, these white monsters. Now we don't have a fusion deck, we have an extra deck, now we have two monsters. Fui o YouTube Music Creamy, um efeito pra você. Tá festas com seus amigos e a família. And people were certainly worried if fusion monsters would ever see play again, because why would you want to use a polymerization plus two monsters when you could just use the two monsters and make a really powerful synchro? And also keep in mind here that the synchros released out of the first few sets under 5Ds were incredibly powerful. I think I talked about this before, but in Duelist Genesis, every single synchro monster in that pack, except maybe one of them, Nitro Warrior, all the other ones though saw competitive play at some point in time. Whenever a card game company adds a new mechanic to their trading card game, they want it to be competitively viable and casually fun right out of the gate. What I find really intriguing though is that many of the die-hard old-school Yu-Gi-Oh fans actually do fondly remember Synchros, at least right now. Synchros are 12 years old. They basically are old-school Yu-Gi-Oh, or a part of old-school Yu-Gi-Oh. They're even in Duel Links right now, which is considered to be sort of a less modern version of the game, with a smaller card pool and with less extra deck mechanics. Now, I was pretty young when Synchros were introduced into Yu-Gi-Oh, but I had just had my birthday like a week prior, so I remember picking up that 5D starter deck as like an extra birthday present a week later after having a party, and it was really, really exciting. You know, I know I know not everyone likes it when a new mechanic comes out, but at least me in middle school or whatever, I was very, very excited to see these new white bordered cards and these new tuner monsters. I'm pretty sure I put Junk Synchron and bad level 2 monsters like Speed Warrior into almost every single deck that I played that summer. The first set of Master Rules really did lay the groundwork for the next four Master Rules that would be released. Not only did players pretty much always expect a new extra deck mechanic with each new Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, but also they expected some minor or not some minor changes in other gameplay elements. In this case, it was the maximum deck size for your main deck, extra deck, and side deck, but in some other cases you'll see some changes that really do fundamentally change Yu-Gi-Oh! not only by adding new mechanics, but also just changing some older rules. The second set of Master Rules released in July 12, 2011 for the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG, and like I've said a couple times, I believe that this is the only case where one of the changes for this Master Rule didn't actually hit the TCG for several months after the starter deck was released. So the starter deck did include the Exceeds monster, which is a whole new mechanic, like I said, a new extra deck mechanic, and this thing did change the game forever. One of the things that I really enjoyed about Exceeds monster and this starter deck getting released is that Tommy actually wrote a couple articles describing why Exceeds monsters were an important sort of next step compared to Synchros. Because one of the things that they talked about, which absolutely was true, was that not every deck had a tuner monster, not every deck had the capacity to summon uh, different level monsters to make these synchro monsters, you know, level 5 synchros, level 6 synchros, those ones weren't always easy to access, and level 7s, level 8s are very powerful once again if your deck wasn't capable of spamming a lot of differently leveled monsters and also putting tuners on the board, you just wouldn't be able to summon them. So by changing it and making it so you just needed two monsters of the same level instead of a tuner and a non-tuner, it made a lot more decks capable of 
with so many extra deck monsters. This was, at least initially, pretty well received by the community, at least in my opinion, from what I saw at tournaments and when this was happening. People were really excited because there were plenty of decks up there that really couldn't summon synchros and wanted to summon something from the extra deck but just didn't have the capability to do so. So it sees monsters, I mean, as Konami described it, I believe, in one of those articles, as long as you have two copies of any of the monsters in your deck, you can likely make at least one exceeds. If I have two copies of Mystic Tomato, on my deck and all the other monsters at different levels, I can at least know that if I draw both those Mystic Tomatoes, I can make one rank four. For the time that these were released, it was a really big deal not necessarily having to cram a bunch of tuner monsters into every single deck. Generally speaking, when Exceeds monsters first came out, and especially for the first couple sets, people either had mostly Exceeds monsters in their extra deck or mostly Synchros. What was really interesting is that for the first year or so, we didn't see a lot of overlap between Synchro Monsters and Exceeds Monsters in terms of being played in the same decks. What I mean by that is that generally speaking, you look at an extra deck, you have like either 12 Synchros and 3 Exceeds, or 12 Exceeds and 3 Synchros. What do I mean by this? Well, for example, Tengu Plants, or Tutor Guide Tengu Plants, they mostly played Synchro Monsters for all of their tuners and their crazy combos. However, once Tour Guide from the Unrolled became a common card to play in that strategy, obviously you need a rank 3 monster, usually like a line of Zen Mains or number 17 Leviathan Dragon, and then maybe like a regular Utopia just in case you want to make a rank 4, but still primarily a Synchro deck. On the other hand, if you saw an XC strategy like Windups or Dino Rabbit or something along those lines, the only synchros you'd commonly see in those decks is like one copy of Armory Arm or one copy of Allied Justice Catastrophe, pretty much exclusively made only if you draw a Feck Builder and already have a monster on the field. As time went on, we saw more and more strategies actually use both Xyz monsters and synchro monsters at the exact same time, but at least for the first year or so, we didn't really see that too often outside of a couple strategies, but this starter deck also introduced problem solving card text into the TCG. Now in the OCG, they still do not have problem solving card text, they have their own way of writing cards, but for the TCG, this would pretty much change the game forever, we're still using problem solving card text to this day. It's gone through a couple different revisions, but for the most part, the original articles that Konami wrote about problem solving card text from all those years ago still are pretty much true right now. This made it a lot easier to tell what part of the card was the cost, which part was the activation condition, which part was the effect, and also really important things like if a card targeted or if a card didn't target, which before this we literally had no idea which cards targeted and which cards didn't target until Konami said something. There are a lot of old school cards that don't say target or the word select but do target. It was just really, really confusing for a very, very long time. Now you might be saying, wait a second, DZ, if when I play my matches, I still don't know all of my rulings. Maybe you're confused about the cost of a card, maybe you're confused about targeting or some non-targeting, and while I sympathize with you and I hope that the game becomes more understandable, almost all, like 90 to 95 percent of the comments that I see in my own comment section that are ruling questions pretty much stem from the fact that the person that is leaving the comment does not understand the problem solving card text. In Yu-Gi-Oh, every single word, every single piece of punctuation matters. They all have specific purposes given the context of this game. If you don't know that, it can be really confusing, but if you research just for a little bit, like a few hours, suddenly a lot more of the interaction that you might have been confused about will probably make more sense. I've actually made several videos on my own channel just talking about and giving examples of problem solving card text, because even if you're only playing Yu-Gi-Oh on a casual level, just with your friends or whatever, it is still really, really good to know how to properly read Yu-Gi-Oh cards. It'll make your life a lot easier and I'll make Yu-Gi-Oh a lot less confusing. Now in the OCG, the Master Rule 2 change didn't only add Xyz monsters to the game, it also removed Ignition Effect Priority, which I'll explain in just one moment. We wouldn't see the removal of Ignition Effect Priority in the Yu-Gi-Oh TCG until April of 20...
2012, so obviously many months after that July started that. We're pretty detached from ignition effect priority at this point. I mean, it's been eight years. This was pretty much one of the biggest changes to the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game for a long time. Maybe not more than an extra deck summoning mechanic like Xyz Monsters or Secret Monsters, but certainly really, really impactful. Basically, ignition effect priority before this let you use non-quick effects on monsters as quick effects in their summoning window. What's an example of this? Well, for example, if you summoned Blacklister Soldier and were the beginning, you had a chance to respond to the summon, your own summon, with its banishing effect before your opponent had a chance to stop it with Barnum's Trap Hole or Torrential Tribute. Another extremely relevant example is that when you normal summon a Rescue Rabbit under the previous rule set, you were allowed to banish it as cost for its own effect before your opponent got a chance to respond. This made a card like Effect Veiler pretty much useless against cards like the Rescue Rabbit because your opponent would always just banish it as cost before you had a chance to stop the effect. While the term priority still exists in Yu-Gi-Oh, it doesn't exist in the same capacity that it used to back in the day. This really, in my opinion, was not how Yu-Gi-Oh was supposed to work. It made certain effects almost impossible to deal with, and it meant that if your opponent summoned a big monster with a powerful effect, you didn't even have a chance to respond before they got to use that effect. Think of cards like Judgment Dragon immediately summoning themselves to the field, and even if you had a bottomless or torrential, well, it doesn't matter, you still lose your entire board. Blacklist of Soldier, Rescue Rabbit, Judgment Dragon, all these are very powerful and popular cards that benefited in a huge way before this change went into effect. While on summon effects certainly did exist before this change happened, I think this really did make it so a lot of different effects could be made. For example, if you only want an effect to be activated whenever, they can make it a quick effect. Or maybe they only want it to be able to be used on summons. They can make it an on summon effect. Or maybe they want it to be neither of those things. They can make it a really powerful effect, like Judgment Dragon, and make it not an on summon effect, or not a quick effect. And now, with this new change, it actually can't be used before your opponent has a chance to respond to a summon. While this change did not make its way to the TCG alongside its Seed Monsters, it still was considered part of Master of 2 in this so I figured I would at least do a little bit of discussing it in today's video. That brings us to July of 2014 with Master Rule 3. Now, in my opinion, this was one of the most controversial changes in all of Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and also has some of the most amount of changes of any Master Rule that we've seen, not only before this, but also after it. Master Rule 3 is still one of the most contentious discussion points for Yu-Gi-Oh right now. I've even made a couple videos in the past talking about this, and I still see a lot of very, very angry people. If there's ever been a time where the most amount of people quit Yu-Gi-Oh, within like a couple months, it probably was Master Rule 3. First up we have Pendulum Monsters, and this is really where most of the angry comments sort of stem from. It's all about Pendulum Zones, and Pendulum Monsters, and Pendulum Scales. This is what got a lot of people really, really mad at Konami for doing. Now, I've mentioned in the past, actually in one video specifically, where Pendulum Monsters actually weren't as overpowered, weren't nearly as overpowered as many players actually thought they would be. If you're someone that has quit Yu-Gi-Oh because of Master Rule 3, because of Pendulum Summoning, you have not seen that video, make sure to go check it out, it'll be in the description below, because Pendulum Monsters actually ended up not being that overpowered. However, the change was really, really big for a couple of reasons. Now you have these weird half-spell, half-monster cards, and they have two different effects. They have Pendulum Scales, they go to the extra deck face-up, how does that work, who knows? There were a lot of really confusing interactions and rulings with Pendulum Monsters pretty much right from day one. That definitely is very, very complicated and very confusing, and I understand people got discouraged from learning new 